Well, first off, I thought I was going to be sitting in the back row there. <laughs> but, so I really didn't come, you know, with any prepared text or anything. I I would be more than glad to uh, offer my, you know, input into the, the I guess the pharmacy aspect of things as it as it comes up and stuff. I just in a nutshell, I guess from what I've been reading about the the current proposals and stuff, I really don't see where it's going to solve problems. I, I think it's going to be a, an extremely, I guess, over-regulated expansion to attempt to try to ensure people who, in my opinion, quite a few of them don't, or almost voluntarily choose not to, to have health insurance. I know when I read Mike's uh, article in the Gazette during the Times uh, about a month ago or so, I think he said something like, 16% of people in 1998 um, were uninsured, and that was, you know, economically a pretty um, scary time, I guess. Or no, I mean, excuse me, that was more of a robust time. 2009, 11 years later, we're probably in one of the worst economic times that any of us can remember. And I think the figure was 15% of people are currently uninsured. Uh, I don't have a lot of confidence in the government being able to step in and solve that problem. But really, like I say, I don't really have any... Are, are there particular issues you deal with as a pharmacist in your pharmacy when you talk about <coughs> being able to provide good health care for the customers who come in the door? What are the things that you bang your head against the wall about that, that puts a wall between you and your patient? Yeah, yeah there are quite a few more than there used to be, of course, historically. Uh, we deal with an awful lot of, I guess, formulary issues. It, it really is, is is cumbersome for us when when big people come in and they're on a set, you know, regimen of five or six drugs and, and because of formulary changes on their insurance program, regardless of whether it be private insurance or Medicaid or Medicare and Part D plans, um, you know, we have to sometimes make two or three changes, you know, right there in order for uh, that person to continue to get at least a comparable, you know, uh, therapeutic regimen. Um, because for whatever reason, uh, their new plan is not paying for the meds that they have been on and they have been stable on for an existing period of time. That always leads to a lot of uh, <coughs> unknowns with regards to how they're going to react to the new medicines and things of that nature. I guess I don't know whether I can totally blame those kinds of things on anything at the federal level, although I guess I do think that that type of thing, whether it be step therapy, closed formularies, um, other creative ways of cost containment, I, I think that will be much more pronounced in the future uh, if if the government gets more involved and, and we go to more of a single payer program. I, I see some drug companies really suffer because their products that that were doing well all of a sudden they get bumped by bigger drug manufacturers with the <coughs> drug and, and uh, they lose a significant market share uh, because of some of these closed formulary decisions and things like that. I have just a question here. Do you ever have someone come in that has no insurance and doesn't have money to pay those bills? And oh. what, do you, what do you do with situations like that? If you can refer them to somebody to, if uh, you have any situations like that? Oh, quite often, yeah. Okay. It really depends on the person. Uh, we, sometimes the samples are available. We can direct them back up to the clinic. Sometimes there are assistant programs that the manufacturers okay. might offer. Uh, probably the thing we do most often is to is to research uh, an appropriate uh, generic that might be quite a bit less expensive. <coughs> Point them in that direction, contact the doctor, see if they'd be willing to consider an alternative. And of course, house charges and all sorts of options there. John, I, John, I have a question for you. Uh, uh, it seems as though that uh, my wife Sharon, if there's any uh, any adverse effect on any drug, she she gets it. And and uh, one of the 
one of the diuretics that, that she's taking is she's allergic to sulfa, so that's kind of a problem, as I know you're a lot more aware than I am. But um, uh, uh, she's uh, the generic drug that uh, the generic type of that thing uh, it didn't work for her. So uh, and and we had this, and she did she did this work. She searched around to try to find you know she was very cautious of the shape of the pill, which I guess is indicative of the men. I don't know if you know if that's right or not. Anyway, she she searched around a bit and found it at high BC Rapids. <laughs> now you know if we're I know that this is kind of a, a you know, uh, I would assume, I would hope that this is, this is a rarity, that a person like herself, uh, you know, that not very not very many people would have this kind of sensitivity to certain drugs and even a manufacturer's drug. But um, uh, what my question is, I guess, is 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 this going to get worse? I mean, are 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 we looking at are we looking at uh, Generics not being exactly the same as another generic by by a different manufacturer, or is I don't really see that as getting any better or worse. I guess, in, at least in the foreseeable future, the generic industry I think is still pretty reputable. There are some things that might alter that um, reimportation of. Uh, of uh, products either from Mexico or Canada, you lose track of the quality sometimes when when that takes place. Uh, the regulations would again be heightened. Um, and I, I personally haven't run across any situations where I felt that, that any of the generics, you know, that I've gotten in were suspect. But I've read enough articles and situations where I guess that's a possibility. All right. Any other things you want to? No, I'm 